a major setback for the pro-life movement in Kansas. Voters rejected a proposed amendment declaring that the state constitution does not grant the right to an abortion. Both sides of the abortion divide poured millions of dollars into their campaigns. The outcome raises concerns that Kansas could become the abortion capital of the country. Heather Sells reports. Pro-life Kansans had hoped voters would approve a proposed constitutional amendment overriding a 2019 state Supreme Court decision. That decision declared abortion a fundamental right. This is a re really about Kansans taking back their constitution, taking back their ability to place even the most basic restrictions on the abortion industry. Former Kansas governor and senator Sam Brownback said the state's high court ruling was a mistake. This Kansas Supreme Court has determined that there's a right to an abortion in the Kansas Constitution, and it's not there. Both sides invested heavily in this vote, pouring more than 14 million into their campaigns. The nation watched closely as well, as the vote marked the first opportunity for a state to weigh in on abortion since the Supreme Court's ruling in June. Going into Tuesday, Brownback and other pro-life Kansans had worried that a loss could turn their state into an abortion haven. Abortion is just such a tragedy. It's a tragedy for the child and it's a tragedy for the mother. Since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, abortion-minded women have flocked to Kansas as neighboring states like Missouri and Oklahoma have banned it. Kansas currently allows most abortions until the 22nd week of pregnancy. Pro-life advocates had hoped that passage of the amendment would allow state lawmakers to pass abortion restrictions. We haven't been able to pass a pro-life law in Kansas since 2018 because of what our Supreme Court did. Our legislature has little to no ability to place even the most basic regulations. Other states are also poised to vote on abortion this year. Kentucky will try to add similar language to its state constitution. Voters in Michigan and Vermont will also consider abortion rights legislation. Gordon. Well, Heather, I've got to ask what's next for the Kansas pro-life community. Right. I, I think there's some surprise because Kansas is really known as being pro-life. The vote was uh, 59 to 41. Uh, they are saying that there was misinformation from the radical left out there about uh, harm to women. Uh, so that could have impacted this. But yeah, I, I think it's a moment of pause for them. I will also note uh, national pro-life leader uh, and thinker Charlie Camosi said this on Twitter. He said uh, this could perhaps be turned into a good thing if the pro-life movement wakes up. Uh, if you were lulled into a fall sense of security post jobs that is officially over now so perhaps uh, this really just indicates what's at stake and it, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat in the states well how does this defeat uh, impact that debate uh, the debate over abortion restrictions in other states uh, what's your prediction going forward I, I think it's a, a short term. It's a boost for uh, those who support abortion. But I think it's a wake up call for the pro-life movement. There's uh, votes ahead and uh, there's there's a lot of activity in the states right now. And so I think you're going to see that. I, I also think there's going to be a lot of lessons learned from Kansas. And, and one in, in instance, um, Charlie Camosi again says that model legislation should make absolutely clear that physicians will do whatever is necessary to save a mother's life. So I think uh, care and um, concern for women has to be paramount uh, in the pro-life movement going forward. Well, the federal government is now stepping into the state battle. The Justice Department sued Idaho over its new abortion law, claiming it violates federal law. What's the basis of the claim? Right, so very interesting here. This is the first time the Department of Justice has stepped into the fight. There were 13 states that passed trigger laws, laws, pro-life laws that went into effect right after uh, the court overturned uh, Roe v. Wade, and Idaho was one of them. And in essence, the prosecutors are saying that the uh, Idaho law forces uh, doctors to violate a federal law, that's the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, which requires anyone coming into a medical facility to be stabilized. But the Idaho law uh, has exceptions allowing for abortions to be performed uh, to save the life of the mother. So very interesting legal strategy here, and, and we'll see if the Department of Justice is successful. All right. Well, Heather, thanks for the report. Thanks for the analysis. Let me remind Christians that from the beginning of Christianity, you go back to this wonderful book called The Didact, which translates from Greek, The Teaching. 
and it was the teaching of the early church. Some thought it should have been included in the New Testament, uh, but others said, no, this is just instruction for new believers. And in, that, in it, it spells out very clearly that Christians do not practice exposing their children, so they don't practice infanticide, and they don't practice abortion. Uh, it may be news to you, but abortion was available 2,000 years ago. They knew of certain plants that would cause miscarriages, and Christians said, no, we don't do that. We believe in life. Wouldn't it be better to have a culture where we celebrate motherhood? We encourage mothers to give birth to their children. We support them all the way along. When you look at the difficulty most mothers have in raising their children, the cost of it, everything that they have to give up, wouldn't it be great to say, yes, we stand beside you. We want to help you in your time. Well, in other news, the results are in for most of the GP, GOP primary races, although one crucial state is still counting votes. Ephraim Graham has more of our top stories from the CBN Newsroom. Ephraim? Gordon, two important primary races to tell you about in the battles for Republican gubernatorial nominations. In Michigan, businesswoman and conservative commentator Tudor Dixon won the nomination. She was endorsed by former President Donald Trump. Dixon is pro-life, and she blasted Michigan's Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer as the queen of lockdowns for her COVID restrictions. Turning now to Arizona, the day began with no clear winner. Trump endorsed former TV news anchor Carrie Lake, and she had a slight lead over Karen Taylor Robeson, who was backed by former president, my, vice president, rather, Mike Pence. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi left Taiwan today. Her visit triggered an angry response from China. The communist government calling it a serious violation of the One China Principle. Shortly after her plane landed Tuesday, China announced several days of live fire military exercises in airspace and waters surrounding the island. Taiwan claims some of the drills could spill over into its territorial waters and threaten civilian shipping. In a news conference with Taiwan's president, Pelosi emphasized America's stands with them in the face of Chinese aggression. It's really important uh, for the message to be clear that in the Congress, House and Senate, Democrats and Republicans are committed to the security of Taiwan in order to have Taiwan be able to most effectively defend themselves. The Biden administration and Republican members of Congress are supporting the speaker's visit. She continues her Asia tour with stops in South Korea and Japan. Turning now to Israel, 20 years ago, a suicide bomber killed nine people in an attack at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. The accomplices in that attack just got a pay raise thanks to a Palestinian policy known as pay to slay. As Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, Israel is cracking down on this practice of paying terrorists and their families. The bombing took place at the Frank Sinatra cafeteria at Hebrew University on July 31st, 2002. It came in the middle of what was called the Second Intifada, a four-year-long terror campaign against Israelis. The IDF arrested those responsible, some who have been in prison for 20 years. Here we're talking about nine people murdered, over 80 injured. Five of those murdered were actually American citizens. And now the PA is literally paying additional rewards to those terrorists. Maurice Hirsch of the Palestinian Media Watch explains the Palestinian Authority law, which standardizes payments to terrorists. And sets a pay scale, which goes up, where the salary goes up every period of time on an automatic basis. So one of those increments is when you have served 20 years in jail, you then get a 14 and a bit percent um, pay rise and your salary goes up. Israel also passed its own anti-terror law in 2018. That reduces the amount of tax revenue they return to the PA that's equal to the money the Palestinian Authority pays terrorists in jail. Just days ago, they stopped payment of more than $170 million to the PA. But the process of paying money to terrorists, known as pay to slay, is deeply embedded in the Palestinian Authority. I cannot impress upon you how deeply suited and rooted this entire policy is. If, as Mahmoud Abbas has repeatedly said, if there's only one penny left in the coffers of the Palestinian Authority, he will pay it to terrorists. Four years ago, the U.S. Congress passed the Taylor Force Act, 
to stop USA to the Palestinians from going to pay terrorists. The Palestinian Authority just don't care. While they constantly say that America is failing the Palestinians by not providing them with aid, really all they have to do is stop paying terrorists, stop rewarding the murderers of American citizens, and they'll be able to get the money. Hirsch says the world needs to wake up to how the PA keeps alive this perpetuation of terrorism. Probably the most poisonous idea affecting peace between Israelis and Palestinians at the moment is the payment of these rewards to terrorists. The international community must get together, must implore the Palestinian Authority to abolish this policy and condition all aid to the PA on abolishing this policy. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. We've long reported on the pay to slay policy still quite disturbing, Gordon. And it's still active. Uh, the Taylor Force Act is in force and in effect, but they figured out ways to get around it, to continue to funnel money to uh, the Palestinian Authority and to UNRWA. Uh, the fundamental ideology hasn't changed. They want to reward their martyrs. They call them the Shahid. They view them as heroes. They put statues in their square. They name streets after them. It, it is absolutely horrific how they reward people based on the number of Israelis they are able to kill. Uh, this has to stop. If you're looking for peace, if you're just stop this and stop the payments. It's high time we say to the Palestinian Authority, no more. The current administration seems to have some kind of dream that you can reinvigorate peace talks, you can talk about a two-state solution, you can talk about returning to the 1967 borders, but all of that is living in some kind of fantasy world because you're ignoring the under, un, underlying ideology. And it really doesn't matter who's in charge of the Palestinian Authority, whether it's Hamas or Hezbollah or the PLO. All of these groups want to wipe out Israel. It's a fundamental ideology. They don't believe in a two-state solution. They want Israel to go away. We should take them at their word. Everywhere you look, the gay lifestyle is on full display in entertainment, politics, and now even in education. Well, no wonder more and more families have children questioning their gender. Charlene Aaron brings us this report on how the church can provide help dealing with gender identity. Disney isn't backing down from its commitment to advancing an LGBT agenda. Its latest film, Thor, Love and Thunder, is said to be filled with LGBT storylines, leading some Christian groups to boycott against the movie. This all leads to the question, how should the church address the issue while offering love, hope and healing? I mean, I was a believer. I knew Jesus and I knew what scripture said, but here I was in these relationships. Jeff Johnston, who once lived as a gay man, recalls what it was like when he told his Christian parents. They were both sad and upset that I had been struggling with this all these years, um, but they loved me. They told me they loved me, and they said, you know, if there's anything we can do to help you in this struggle, let us know what it is. Johnston now serves as culture and policy analyst with Focus on the Family and is helping parents navigate gender identity discussions with their children. We believe it's important that parents begin teaching their children at a young age about God's design for humanity, for relationships, and for marriage. You're not talking to kids about sex at this point. 21% of Generation Z Americans, those born between 1997 and 2003, identify as LGBT, nearly double the number of millennials who do so. With that in mind, Johnston encourages Christian parents to talk and remain engaged. I've seen this tear families apart. I encourage parents to maintain a relationship with their child, to do what you can to maintain a relationship with them while you're still holding on to biblical truth. It's a subject Dr. Preston Sprinkle, head of the Center for Faith, Sexuality and Gender, often addresses as parents whose children struggle with their sexuality seek his help. 
somehow we need to not candy coat the truth, not not water down the truth, but as good missionaries, we need to realize how can we best communicate this truth in a way that's not just going to be heard by a younger generation, but it's going to be believed and celebrated. Sprinkle, author of People to Be Loved and other related books, says that means approaching the conversation with sensitivity and compassion. If my 13-year-old came home one day and says, all right, I want you to call me they, them. Here's my new name. I'm going to be like, oh, let's hold the phone here. Let's have a, <laughs> no, I, I, you know, let's, I, I would very graciously want to understand why they want to be called this, you know, just really show that I care about you as a person, hundred percent primary. That's the fundamental. I care about you as a person. I care about what you're going through. The subject is a tough one for many in the faith community who hold to the importance of scripture, such as Genesis 127, which says God created them male and female. Sprinkle says while a growing number of churches are open to addressing the topic, others remain hesitant. I think we would be pastorally irresponsible if we said, I will not help, I will not disciple the people God's entrusted me in some of the most pressing ethical questions facing the church today. There are some more nuanced ways in which we can embody both grace and truth in a way that I think, I mean, I think churches would probably grow if people realize, hey, this church is really engaged in this conversation in a real thoughtful, humanizing way. I think you would probably, your church would probably gain more. You might lose some people, but I think there's going to be more people that are like, oh my gosh, finally, a church is willing to talk about this. So yeah, si silence isn't an option in 2020. It wasn't an option in 2010, but we got away with it. 2022, it's, it's not an option. Meanwhile, Sprinkle says the church's job is to stand for biblical truth while doing so with biblical grace. When you start talking to actual people, it, it does, it does some, uh, sometimes interrupt your presupposition. Hear stories, talk to people, ask questions. I mean, it does, doesn't mean, obviously, it doesn't mean you agree with everything they say, but um, I've, people get blown away and they find out you're a Christian and you're interested in them as a, as a human person. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Well, that's the number one way to disciple anyone. Show that you are truly interested, that we love one another. For too long, the gay community has been used as some kind of scapegoat and persecuted. No, let's not do that anymore. Let's, let's have open doors and say, we love you. God loves you. Let there be peace on earth, goodwill to all people. Um, but there's a better way, and there's a better way of living. And God did indeed make us male and female. Terry? We get it. You barely have enough time to do all the things you have to do, let alone the fun things you want to do. Annie F. Down says that's no way to live. Having fun isn't just extra, it's essential. Annie F. Downs says we all need more fun in our lives. Even when it's hard and even when you're disappointed, finding fun changes things. Annie is a best-selling author, speaker, and founder of the That Sounds Fun Network. As a podcaster, she tackles tough topics, always returning to the truth that God is good and life is a gift. In her newest book, Chase the Fun, Annie helps you identify some of the deeper roots of fun and make what sounds fun to you a priority. Well, Annie joins us now live via Skype. And Annie, it's great to have you back on the show. Good morning, Terry. I'm so glad to see you. Talk a little bit about this, because right off the bat, you say fun is essential. So then what do you say to people who think that they don't have time for it? Yeah, you know, we all of us have two things. We have a calendar and we have a to-do list. And what ends up happening with our to-do list, we have things like clean out the guest room closet and um, get the car vacuumed out and, and make sure you do something fun this week. Well, those things on the list are things that when we lay down at night, we go, man, I hate I didn't get to that. But anything that's on our calendar, like lunch with friends or going to work or even sleeping every night, we don't miss because we realize in order to be healthy, I've got to have these things. Things. And so I'm just believing and seeing in my life and a life of a lot of people around us that, that if we can move fun from our to-do list to our actual calendar, it helps us to be more healthy in our lives. Well, you say in your book, Chase the Fun, that some of us need to ask ourselves, when did I quit having fun? Is that a common issue for us as we grow up? <laughs> 
Yeah, because I think a lot of times we label the people who are still having fun as adults like Peter Pan, right? Like that they've just decided the world is, they're not realistic to the world. But as we know, and it says in scripture, right? Like even in laughter, the heart may ache. Joy and suffering actually need to go together. We need joy and sadness to operate at the same time. So if people have left fun and they're only doing their hard to do list and hard calendar and, and seeing the world um, through the lens of, I can't can't have fun because this is just too hard. I think we're actually missing out on the balance that God really offers us in life. So why do you think being an amateur at something and even failing at something can be a good thing? I mean, most people would look at that as a negative. Well, I don't love failure either, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm not like, that sounds so fun. <laughs> but the reality is, is that when we are new at something, when we're an amateur, there is joy to it if we will let ourselves see it that way, whether it's a new cookbook or a new relationship or a new sport we're going to try or a new church we're going to visit. Can we go, man, it is okay that I don't know how to do this perfectly. We're experiencing it a lot in our culture because we get to have conversations that we're not prepared professionals at having conversations on, but can we be amateurs and go, hey, I'm learning, but I'd love to talk about this. Hey, I'm learning, but I'd love to try skateboarding. Hey, I'm learning, but I'd love to try this recipe and learn and grow from it and just find some joy in not having to be a professional at everything. So giving ourselves grace in the midst of it all. Talk yeah. a little bit yeah. about the importance of hobbies. You write about that in the book. I'm a firm believer in the need to establish those early on in life. Yes, and hang on to them, right? And even if they change and morph as you grow. Uh, a friend of mine says that if you work with your hands, you should Sabbath or rest with your mind. And if you work with your mind, you should Sabbath with your hands. So I find myself in my hobbies, because a lot of my job is talking and writing, I find myself, my hobbies are moving my body, being outside, cross-stitching, gardening. And we've got to have hobbies that give us a little bit of space and time. I find that that's when I connect with God most is when I get off my phone, get off social media, and I'm sitting and reading, or I'm out on a walk. Or, and so all these hobbies really give us connection and, and bring some vulnerability into our lives that God can use as a conduit to really speak to us. It, fun is way more than just relaxing. It's actually a spiritual thing. You mentioned this a little bit earlier, but how is grieving or learning to say yes or no, or I'm sorry, part of having fun? It seems so the opposite. <laughs> I know, right? And that is okay if it feels that way. I like to say a lot that your feelings can ride with you. They just don't get to drive, right? So it's okay if you feel like, man, how could I ever have fun and grief? But I'll tell you, it, Perry, even last night, I sat in a room with friends and we are grieving something and our pastor was with us and, and he said, it's okay if we laugh in the next few weeks. We're going to have these moments where it's up and down. And so, so grief needs to go hand in hand with the fun you're having and not shame yourself if you find yourself laughing on a hard day and saying yes and no. You know, it, when we say yes to something, we're saying no to a lot of other things. But man, that good and right yes is going to open up some really fun doors. So even the things in your life that seem challenging or hard or disappointing, can we at the same time say, is there a little bit of joy in this? Because I really think if you chase the fun, joy is going to follow. And if we're told to choose that, to choose joy. Yeah. Yeah. You're a person of faith, Annie. How does your faith affect the way that you have fun? Well, I think there's a lot of that that happens because, you know, in the almost the word fun, when people talk about having fun, a lot of times our minds go straight to debauchery, right? Or to decisions that we will regret in the future. And, and so one of the things I've enjoyed is getting to talk about this so much and write about it and experience it with my friends is how do we redeem fun? How do we bring fun into our faith life? Because when a bunch of our friends are out rafting down a river and we're having a great time, there, there usually is a moment where someone says, how are you really doing? And, and, and God just gets invited into these fun moments, whether it's a water slide. I went down a water slide with some of my friends who are kids last weekend, and in it, I felt some insecurities rising up. So even in that moment of walking up those stairs, I got to say to God, hey, this is really fun, but 
but something is stirring in me that I think you and I need to talk about. And I think if we are self-aware of that and if we are listening to what's going on in our own hearts and minds while we're having fun, often God shows up and it becomes a spiritual moment. You know, for some people, like I can, I just know your personality. You are, you are able to chase fun with a certain freedom, Fair. joie de vivre. <laughs> but not everybody has that, the personality to do that. I mean, you chase the fun. Your new book is, is a guide to, to helping people pursue that. But what do you want the takeaway from this book to be? Yeah, my hope is that everyone who reads it and goes through those 100 days, we're actually going to lead a group through it starting on August 15th. But as we go through those 100 days, my hope is that people will let go of the expectation that fun needs to be loud and big and expensive. And, and it has to be these vacations that last for three weeks. And how do we find fun in the life that we have right now? And, and when I think about fun, I don't think that you have to have my personality, though you're right, it helps. It certainly helps. I can pied piper us to it, though, no matter what your personality is, because there are a lot of my friends whose personalities are not the same as mine, and they find fun in quieter ways. And there are days where my fun is quiet, too. But man, what an invitation to all of us. My hope is that on the other side of these 100 days that you have a hobby that you love. You feel connected to God and others and yourself and that you have found fun in the life you had instead of thinking the only way I'm going to find fun is if I build a whole different life. Well, there's so much stress in the world. Chasing fun is a great idea. It really allows us to be free from a lot of that stress. Annie, thank you. I want our viewers to know your latest book is called Chase the Fun, 100 Days to Discover Fun Right Where You Are. It's available nationwide. And don't forget to check out Annie's podcast. It's called That Sounds Fun. Welcome back to the Seventh Street Club for this CBN News Break. Today, a Christian flag flies over Boston, bringing an end to years of battling. Back in 2017, the city denied an application to raise the flag during an event hosted by Camp Constitution. The reason for the denial, the application form referred to the flag as Christian. After years of court cases, the Supreme Court ruled 9-0 to zero. Boston's denial was unconstitutional under the First Amendment's free speech clause. So now the flag flies. A powerful song of praise reverberating through the nation's capital. Nathan Kistler, the executive director of Hope to Hill Ministries, recently filled the Capitol Rotunda with the Lord's Prayer. For the What a voice, a crowd gathered around Kistler as he sang, some recording the moment, others seemingly praying alongside him. Hope to the Hill aims to encourage and minister to politicians, offering prayer to those carrying the weight of leadership. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website, it's cbnnews.com. According to the United Nations, more than 12 million people have fled their homes since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Nearly half of them have left the country entirely. In Poland, we met a refugee named Valentina. She told us what happened when the Russians invaded her town and why, at long last, she has found peace. Before the war, Valentina lived a happy life in Ukraine. She was employed as a caregiver and her granddaughters enjoyed going to school every day. We had a house, food, we had everything we needed. There was enough to live on. Suddenly, everything changed. When Russian forces invaded their town, it became a war zone. Valentina and her family took shelter from the bombings and lived in fear. We stayed in the basement for a month. We went outside sometimes, but if there was a bombardment, we went straight back to the basement. After enduring the terrors of war for a month, Valentina left Ukraine with her young granddaughters to keep them safe. On the long road into the unknown, Valentina met an Operation Blessing team. We connected Valentina with the local church we partner with. Here, thanks to Operation Blessing donors and volunteers, we're providing refugee families shelter, hygiene supplies, and warm food. 
Here they find peace. Such a simple word, peace. But what a powerful meaning, not only for us, but for the whole world. We have peace in this place. Volunteers feed us, care for us, and give us everything we need to live on. We do not grieve here because we found a lot of help here. People in Ukraine and some of the surrounding areas are just struggling and suffering through so much. I, I just want to tell you, if you're a 700 Club member, what a tremendous difference you are making in the midst of their loss, their grief, their fear, their pain. We are there, and we're there in your name because of your generosity and kindness. That's just one of the places in the world where you're making a difference, but you are making a life-changing difference healing difference. You know, there are some times where people go through difficult things and only the message of God's love can bring hope. And usually that needs to follow some kind of very practical help, like a safe place to live, like food to eat, just the freedom from not hearing the assault of bombs and guns going off. That's Ukraine, but you 700 Club members are touching the world with the peace and the love of Jesus Christ. We want to say thank you. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. And we want to invite the rest of you to join with us, will you, in making a difference in the lives of people who are really, truly hurting. We really can change the world with our love and our unity if we're willing to. Some of you are 700 club members, but you have the opportunity to go up to another club level. Can I show you the options? There's the general membership on the top, $20 or more a month, but you could go up to 700 club gold at $40 a month, or even join the 1,000 club level at $84 a month. We have a 2,500 club level, $209 a month, and then our founders at 417 or more a month. Ask God what he'd have you to do, and then join with excitement and anticipation over the difference you're going to make in someone's life. Many lives, really. Every day, thousands and thousands of people have their lives touched because of 700 Club members. When you join, we want to say thank you by sending you Pat's latest teaching, Putting on the Armor of God. This is a teaching from the book of Ephesians. In the world today, we all need to know how to do this. This is your gift when you call now. Our number again, toll free, 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. We welcome you to the family of ministries that go out from this place every single day. Gordon? Sean Clayton wanted blood. For years, he was consumed with one thought, revenge against the man who killed his mother. Sean never became a murderer. Instead, he became a ninja warrior. It's just amazing like how far a guy can really take you, you know, from being a crack addict on the streets to running ultra marathons and sitting in the senators' houses having dinner with them. We grew up in a trailer. My dad, he decided he was going to send missionaries and start a painting business. When Sean was 12, his parents also made the decision to adopt three children from Guatemala. They seemed happy. They were happy to be in the family. Me and my older brother, Ugo, had started to work with my dad. Ugo has trouble because he wasn't waking up to go to work like he was supposed to. The quiet day of work was interrupted by a phone call from the police. Something was wrong at home. Me and my dad were driving home trying to figure out what was going on. I remember flying down the highway. I was crying. Uh, they had already taken my brother Ugo back down to the house to start getting his story. He said that he walked in the house. Somebody was in the house with a bandana. They ran past him out the back door. He saw my mom laying on the ground bleeding and ran up the street. They noticed things weren't lining up. By that night, Police had pieced together the real events. Around like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he was playing the Nintendo. My mom told him that he needed to go to his school. He ended up bringing the math book in, had the knife under the math book. And she grabbed it and saw the knife and screamed, and that's when he killed her. He was 14. He ended up getting charged as a juvenile, and um, he got sentenced to 11 years in prison. I thought my mom's life was worth more than 11 years in prison. And so basically from that point on, I decided I was going to kill him. I was a pretty angry guy. Like I didn't understand, you know. I was mad at the world. I ran away from home. I uh, started fighting. I started using drugs. Hoping to put him on a different path, Sean was sent to military school. So I got kicked out when I was 16, came back to South Carolina. 
And my dad was like, you need to do something. Try and join the military or something. So I was like, well, if I join the military, I have extra money and uh, can sell drugs. Dad signed off on it. Um, I turned 17 in June, and I went into the military in September. I was drinking a lot, smoking crack quite a bit right before I went to Afghanistan. While deployed to Afghanistan, Sean continued his self-destructive behavior. But one night, he went too far. I started drinking, and I ended up blacking out. And I was just laying on the ground. And so they took me to the medical tent to try and get me awake. And they finally got me awake. And I wanted to walk out, and one of them grabbed me. They grabbed me, I hit him. And then another guy tried to grab me, and I hit them. And uh, ended up with about five assault charges. Facing 13 charges totaling 36 years in prison, Sean began to reflect and pray. I remember just thinking about life and how it was just going to go on, and that I really didn't matter. Like, my whole life had been so self-centered on me to be this bad dude and kill my brother. I'm going to be like 50 years old. The entire world is going to go on without me, and it's not going to make any difference. I remember praying and just hearing guys say, like, this is the last time I'm going to get you out of something. And shortly after that, um, I had a meeting with my lawyer over there, and they said if I would take the other than honorable discharge, that I would leave the military. I would end up spending 30, 30 days in jail, and um, I would, like, lose my pay for two months, and then I would have the other than honorable discharge, and I would leave the military. Sean served his time and was immediately discharged from the military. I came back. I was definitely, like, dealing with the PTSD stuff. I stopped sleeping at night. I didn't have a job. And I did start drinking again and um, smoking weed. Feeling trapped, Sean eventually accepted his father's invitation to attend church. The pastor was preaching on 1 John chapter 4, where he's talking about how can you say you love God whom you have not seen and hate your brother whom you have seen. I was just thinking about, like, my brother that had killed my mom, and how could I love my brother after he killed my mom? And so I started to wrestle with that for a couple of weeks. I remember just one day I was asking that question. It was like almost, it wasn't audible, but it was like the answer that I got back was, how could I love you when you killed my son? And I just understood the weight of my sin and, you know, that Jesus had died for me, and I understood what love was from that point on. So I knew I had to forgive him. That was a big point. That was a big changing point in my life. I stopped smoking weed altogether. I wasn't getting drunk. You know, like I wasn't out looking for fights or anything like that. Like that was all gone. I got married at 18 right before I deployed. It was so changing that my wife was like, what is happening to you? We started going to church regularly. And I was growing a lot. I was trying to get my life back together, really. Sean was still searching for a challenge and larger purpose when a manager at work suggested an idea. He said that he was going to go run a marathon. And I was like, well, that sounds pretty cool. And I found half marathon, uh, the Spartan Beast. So I started doing the obstacle races and loved the challenge. And I started getting better. So Ninja Warrior, my family told me that I needed to do that. They told me it was just a bunch of obstacles. And I was good at obstacles. Put a video together, sent it in. And they were like, we want you to come on the show. Uh, it's definitely cool to see like what God did with all that. Here I am, you know, this ex, like, gang mayor, crack addict, and, like, I'm sitting in a senator's house having dinner with them. Like, only God can do that stuff. <laughs> a few years later, God restored Sean's military standing. I ended up getting my military discharge upgraded, and they upgraded to honorable. So I didn't even know, but I got all my benefits back. I have a successful marriage. You know, I've been married 11 years. I have kids that are happy. I'm still very busy, full-time school, working and training. I never could have imagined those are the things that I would be doing after the life that I did live. You know, the people that are out there like I was, well, you know, what are you waiting on? Stop running from God, give him a chance, and your life can be completely changed. Your life can be completely changed. And how can it be changed? It's, it's counterintuitive. It's you change through surrendering where you say, God, not my will be done. Uh, here I am, I'm, I'm filled with anger. I, I want vengeance. Uh, I, I want justice my way. I, I want these things. And it's amazing how that then deprives you of life, where you're consumed with it.
and you're nursing these hurts, you're just having this run through over and over and over again. And in that process, you will absolutely try to medicate it away. And whether that's drugs or it's alcohol or something else that you look for, you'll never find peace. And you certainly won't find the peace that passes all understanding. But there's good news for you. If you surrender all of that, if you choose to say, I want to live a life of love, I want to live a life of forgiveness, I want to live a life of peace. I can't do this on my own, but if I surrender, then God will do it for me. Isn't that wonderful? You can have it. And just what you just saw with Sean, he's got a happy, healthy marriage, 11 years. He's got wonderful children. He has a life. He has a hope. He has a future. All of that can be yours if you just say yes to God. God, will you come in? Will you change my heart? Will you make me new again? And in that, he asks you, and it's very clear. He says, if you want forgiveness of the things you've done wrong, then you have to forgive others. It's in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Now, for Sean, that was a big one. His mother had been killed. It wasn't fair. He lost someone very precious. He lost someone he loved dearly. But in that forgiveness, he is able to find life. If you want this, it's yours for the asking. All you have to do is surrender. All you have to do is bow your head with me. Pray a very simple prayer. God will answer it. He will come to you today. He loves you. He died for you. He wants you to be with him for all eternity. He has a plan. He has a purpose. He has a hope. He has a future. And it's all for you if you just ask for it. So let's pray. Let's start this journey together. Pray and let Jesus do all the rest. Pray with me. Jesus Say his name, say it out loud. Jesus, I come to you. And Jesus, I surrender all. You know the hate that's in my heart. You know the vengeance that's in my heart. You know the unforgiveness that's in my heart. Lord, I leave it all with you. I surrender it all. And I ask that you forgive me of all the things that I've done wrong. And yes, in an act of forgiveness, I say out loud, I forgive all, anyone, all of them, anyone who has ever hurt me, I forgive them now. I set them free. Jesus Come into my heart. Make me new again. Give me a heart of love, a heart of forgiveness, a heart after you. And if you do this, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Father, for everyone who just prayed, fill them with love. Fill them with love and forgiveness so it overflows, that it flows out of every word, every action. It flows out of their face, their countenance, their eyes. Give them life and life more abundantly. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to call us and say, yes, I just prayed. There's a wonderful beginning to a whole new journey, a relationship with your creator. When you call, I've got something free for you. It's called a new day. It's a, it's a teaching on what do you do now? How do you live the Christian life? How do you know for sure that your sins are forgiven? You can get it as a download. You can get it as a CD. 
your choice. All you have to do is call for it. 1-800-700-7000. If you have issues with forgiveness, we have another free packet for you on forgiveness. Again, all you have to do is call for it. Uh, or you can go to CBN.com. There's a way you can download your free copy. Again, no financial obligation at all. Absolutely free. We want you to have this. It will really help you walk through steps for forgiveness. So it's yours for the asking. All you have to do is call 1-800-700-7000. Well, it's time for some Facebook questions that have come in. So what's the first one? Well, the first one comes from Clara, who says, I've been praying for my daughter's deliverance for so long. I'm starting to wonder what I'm doing wrong and why I'm not seeing her be delivered and set free. Any thoughts? Uh, Claire, it's not based on your effort. Um, I believe in praying for children. Uh, I pray for my children. Um, it, children will absolutely increase your prayer life. Uh, but at the same time, God has given them free will. And so what do you do to change their will so that they want to turn to God? That's a unique proposition. That doesn't come from pressure. Uh, and it's, it's strange how pressure actually is counterproductive. It doesn't produce what you think it's going to do. I found a great verse, and it's in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 13. I will send messengers, shepherds, after my own heart. Ask God to send wonderful messengers of love after his own heart. Uh, that is the thing that melts the, the rebels when, when they encounter God's love, when they come to themselves and realize that it's better in God's house than it is where they are. When they have that encounter, they come to themselves, they have a witness of love that they haven't gone too far, that God still loves them. He still believes in them. So pray that. Ask for God to send messengers and see what will happen. Okay, this is Amin, also on Facebook, who says, I believe in the supernatural, and I believe in the sheer ability to see into the supernatural. But my question is, how can one open his spiritual eyes to see into the supernatural? Hmm. Uh, there's some issues that your question raises that, you know, I, I would want to talk to you. What are you trying to see? Um, if you're trying to discern evil spirits and that kind of thing, or if you're trying to... Uh, discern the future. I would really caution you. That you're, you're looking for the wrong thing. Um, you know, don't go demon hunting is, is a long-standing word for me. Just, it's, it doesn't lead to what you think it's going to lead. Here's a prayer, and this is from the Apostle Paul, that you would have eyes that were open, ears that were open, and a heart of understanding that you may know the greatness of his power towards us who believe. Ask for more revelation of God. Don't ask for revelation of the supernatural. Ask for revelation of him. When you do that, you get the really good stuff and you get to understand the greatness of his power, his love, his forgiveness towards you. Here's a word from Ephesians. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. God bless you. We'll see you again tomorrow.